Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so excited to have Dr. Katha Fisher on today. Hi, Katha. Hi, Amy. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Me too. Uh, you know, I, I am so impressed by all the things that you've done, your research, the thesis project that you published, and I can't wait to talk about all of it. But before we get into it, I just want to read your bio. You are a fertility doctor at Spring Fertility, New York, where you're the director also of fertility preservation. And as a fertility doctor, you're committed to providing exceptional care and a compassionate experience for her patients. And I truly love and admire that. You're pushing the envelope on the next big things in fertility. And that's what we're going to talk about today, including MRT, and you're going to tell us what that stands for, PRC and polygenic screening and more. We should turn that into a little song. And you're also board certified in reproductive endocrinology and OBGYN, and you graduated, not surprising, with honors from Washington University in St. Louis before attending Mount Sinai for medical school. And you completed your residency at Yale U New Haven Hospital. And then you went on to complete your fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Columbia. And you also helped open now Spring Fertility New York. So welcome. And you guys, obviously, it takes a lot of work to figure out how to make a baby, right? It does. It made me sound so old. Oh my God, don't add up the years. <laughs> And I love asking guests about how they became interested in studying and practicing fertility medicine. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Of course. So I come from a household of two physicians. So I always came to medicine knowing it was an amazing profession. My parents were always super happy and loved what they did. And so work was never work. Um, it also gave me a really early insight into the kinds of patients one could be, which I feel like most medical students don't really know. So the world of fertility came to me when I was doing a rotation at Memorial Sloan Kettering, this big cancer hospital. And I thought I was going to be a surgical oncologist. I was like, I'm going to be a surgeon, what I want to do. And I sat in with breast cancer physicians who were incredible. They were powerful women who had, were able to kind of balance it all in my like 20 year old brain. And it was mostly pretty sad stuff, you know, 30 year old having breast cancer and going through it. And I remember the surgeon saying to me, Kate, come, this is a good one. We cured her. Come listen to this consult. You're going to be wowed. It's like, great. So I went and she was 35. She had stage two breast cancer. She'd come through chemo, radiation, had surgery. And she was there with her husband. And she's like, this is great. So when am I going to get my period back? And when can I have kids? And the room sunk. I didn't know what was going on. And the surgeon said, I'm not sure what's going to happen for you. I came with their radiation. This is a lot. And the woman lost her mind. She was sobbing. She was angry. She said, I would have taken the cancer any day if I could be a mother and really felt robbed. And they left. And the surgeon, again, was a really smart woman. Said, I, I didn't even think about it. She didn't even think about fertility preservation. And that was, oh my God, decades ago at this point, which is mortifying. But um, it was one of those like aha moments. I thought, oh my God, we can do better. I can do better. I can help. And so I really came into fertility thinking more like onco fertility, fertility preservation. Um, and luckily we got better at that. So patients were counseled more, not perfectly, but more than they were um, when I was a medical student. And that's really how I went into the world of fertility was with that in mind. Yeah. Wow. I can tell your passion just from hearing that story for sure. And now you open Spring Fertility New York, which is the East Coast location for them. Congratulations on that. So can you tell us a little bit about Spring Fertility and the New York practice and, you know, how patients can find you guys? Yeah, of course. So when I graduated fellowship, I actually first started at a place called RMA. Um, and RMA New Jersey was for me like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. It was where this amazing research came from. And I just thought, gosh, I want to go there. And if if your listeners know anything about New York, New Jersey, it's really like two separate continents almost. So I would still drive from New York City to New Jersey to go to work every day. And I loved the medicine. I didn't love who I was as a doctor. It was a lot of patients and I didn't get that personalized care that I really wanted to provide. And so I, Peter Klotzky of Spring Fertility said, hey, I'm going to open up New York. What do you think? And I said, I think you're crazy. <laughs> um, and then I said, but I think I'm crazy too. So this sounds great. Uh, so we were able to open up just a little uh, over like two or three weeks ago in, in New York um, and spring 
provides a kind of medicine and the kind of care that I've always wanted to do. It's really individual. I get to see all of my patients perform all of their procedures in this high touch clinical experience where they know their whole team. And then the medicine is exceptional, right? The outcomes are out of this world. And it felt like New York really needed this. All of my friends who would never cross the Hudson River to come see me and who got care in New York City were lacking this. Um, and so I love I love it. I love everything about it so far. Um, I love what Spring can provide. I and mean, then we are in Bryant Park. We're so easy to get to. Uh, you can email hello at Spring Fertility and reach any of us. Um, so it's so far so good. Exciting. Yeah, well, I can't imagine how hard that was during the pandemic to get that all set up. But I, you know, I applaud you guys and I'm, I'm so happy patients have you. And thank you for sharing your general approach to fertility care. I think that um, more and more patients need that individual type care, especially now more than ever. So now I want to dive into some of the next big things in fertility. And as the audience knows, I love to pair technology with care. So just tell us, what are the big things you are seeing on the horizon for fertility care? So I think in general, right, we are all trying to understand why our success rates are somewhat plateaued at between 65 and 72 or 3%. And, you know, as type A people in general, fertility physicians are obsessed with this somewhat failing grade, right? How can we get better? What are we missing? And so I think there's advancement on all different fronts. There's advancement on how the embryo talks to the uterus. How can we improve egg reserve and equality? How can we improve the way that we select embryos and embryo screening and Gratefully, we have tremendous minds in our field attacking this. And so I think these are all of the avenues that we are trying to go down to figure out how do we get that to 80%, 100%, right? Let's shoot for the stars. Um, and so patients are certainly asking me all the time about modalities like PRP or MRT or mitochondrial replacement therapy um, and different kinds of ways to screen embryos and what's the best path. And my approach to those questions is really just an honest conversation because gosh, we don't have those answers yet, right? We just have a lot of information that we're trying to figure out what, what may be the best approach. Um, and so it's just about knowledge sharing. Well, why don't we just talk about the first one that you just mentioned, PRP, which stands for platelet-rich plasma. What is it and how is it being used in fertility treatments? So the concept of platelet-rich plasma really came from the orthopedics literature. And what it is, it's a way to take um, peripheral blood, so it's just a simple venous puncture, we will spin it down or centrifugic and think of blood, it's a really thick liquid. And so we separate out the parts that are necessary for essentially cells to come and be attracted and for more cells to grow. In the orthopedic literature and where it came from, what we discovered is this really helped generate cartilage and improve joint health. And it has tremendous success there, so much so that it's covered by insurance. And so then we borrowed this and thought, huh, could this help the ovaries, right? Because what we know is that women are born with all of our eggs um, and the blood supply of the ovary is somewhat fixed. And the question is, is there a way for us to inject more growth factors, right? More blood flow, potentially even stem cells, which are really not found in the ovary to the point where you can make new eggs and might we see some improvement? And so essentially what you do when you do PRP therapy is you take the patient's own peripheral blood. It's really an easy procedure. It's just they have in your blood run for any other hormone. You spin it down, you separate out the growth factors and the platelets, and then you take that and you inject it back into the ovary the same way that you would do in an egg retrieval. So essentially transvaginally, large needle, you're asleep, you never feel it. And then you monitor over the next couple of months and see, do you increase the number of antifollicles seen? And what the literature has shown us so far is you can increase AMH that way. And so that would make us believe that we're increasing that oocyte or egg pool and that you can decrease FSH. So making us think that the brain thinks we're doing something right because the brain's no longer yelling at the ovaries. And then the hope is that's gonna translate into more eggs retrieved and more embryos and hopefully more healthy embryos. Um, so this is all still really cutting edge. There aren't huge trials that are proving efficacy. So this becomes kind of the gray in medicine, which is do we not offer it because it's not 100% ready for prime time yet? Or do we offer it with kind of caveats and say, we're not so sure, but maybe, and the harm is minimal and this might make sense for you. Um, I think who it's gonna make the most sense for is the young woman who has diminished ovarian reserve. I think that's gonna be the population that's really gonna benefit from PRP therapy, but certainly the jury's out on efficacy at this moment. What I would love to do is somehow do an egg retrieval, especially in patients who have decreased ovarian reserve who need to embryo bank and somehow with their retrievals, perhaps you know, do PRP while they're asleep for their first retrieval to see if it could help for future retrievals too. I wish that, you know, maybe one day we'll maybe be doing day. that. Maybe, maybe one day. we'll do a partnership, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I wanna talk about something that you've done actually quite a bit of research on, and that is MRT or mitochondrial replacement therapy. It can be considered controversial, but it does seem to me like it's a matter of time that, you know, 
maybe it's going to be something that's more widely practiced. And I certainly have patients that talk to me about it and I actually wish I could offer it. Can you tell us what is it and who is it helpful for? Yeah. So mitochondrial replacement therapy, what, what we need to understand with the mitochondria are, they are really the energy producing organelles of a cell. And an egg is the largest single cell in the body. And it's the point where the mitochondria is segregated away from the DNA or think about like the brain of the egg. And so when you have that separation, you can really replace the mitochondria without harming one's you know, DNA or blueprint for an embryo or for the egg. So what MRT is, it's really two different classes of uh, patients that this may help. There are the patients with mitochondrial diseases, which invar invariably are lethal. They have really early onset and they're catastrophic and they're always handed down because the mitochondria are handed down maternally, right? So that's the lineage. For mitochondrial replacement therapy, what you can do is you can remove the nucleus, so basically the DNA and the brain, and put it into now a shell, which is mitochondria, and replace it entirely. The reason that this has hit some roadblocks is because it's a therapy for disease. And when it's a therapy for disease, the FDA gets involved. Um, so unlike a lot of our other treatments, like intracytoplasmic sperm injection or PGT, Myeloid replacement therapy has hit roadblocks because there is a lot of oversight on it. And the FDA felt really strongly that we should not be manipulating gametes and basically blocked it and said, we can't offer this. Um, and so we are left with other ways of trying to assess mitochondrial disease. The problem with it is you can't really screen an embryo for it. We've tried, but mitochondria grow dramatically increase after implantation. So at the level of an embryo, it might look okay, but then at the six week mark of a pregnancy it could be catastrophic again, and there's no way to predict it. And so it's really challenging unless you can say, actually there's no disease mitochondria at zero, but still is expansion. Um, and so really the only treatment we're ever gonna have for mitochondrial disease is mitochondrial replacement therapy. So we're kind of at a roadblock there with that, unfortunately. The other population is a population who has, is older. And so the energy of the egg, and I think of an egg as a battery, it's an imperfect metaphor admittedly, but if you say, I can replace the battery or recharge it and not change the actual DNA, that seems like, oh, like everybody should do this, this is amazing, right? Um, right. We're just not quite there yet, but the procedure itself is no more challenging than ICSI. I've seen it hundreds of times, I've tried to perform it myself. I'm no embryologist, so don't let me do your MRT, but it's really not that complicated. So if it's a possibility and if we don't have oversight potentially saying, cause we're not saying we're curing disease is for a different reason. I think people are gonna want this um, as an alternative to egg donation, which at the moment is really tried and true. And you know, you're of a certain age your egg qualities of a certain type. That's really what we talk about um, is egg donation. So this may be an alternative. I mean, I, I would argue that if we had the president of the United States as a woman, and let's say she was over 40 and wanted a baby, I have a feeling the FDA might allow it. I, I mean, no, I, I think a, you and I need to run for president soon, maybe. Oh, a job I would never want, but I think things like egg freezing, embryo baking, birth, all of these things would, would be different if we had a female president. So not that I'm encouraging anyone to go overseas or leave the country for treatments like this. Are there places that people could go now? to actually so, access this, this technology? There are places, so this was really pioneered in England at Newcastle and they offer it for um, couples who have mitochondrial disease. It's a really, it's a lottery, it's a challenging um, center to get into and they only will offer less than 10 a year and they haven't published outcomes data that I have seen recently, but you can go to England and, and have this done. Um, and it's, you know, screened by HIFA, it's a, allowed there, but again, a very select population, mm -hmm. which I could see the U.S. doing at some point, just not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So I want to talk about polygenic testing and polygenic risk, risk scores. So what do people who are trying to conceive need to know about polygenic testing and what does it tell us? So polygenic testing is a way to assess embryos to, to stratify their risk of having diseases such as asthma, diabetes, and certain mental illnesses, which are really not from one, one genetic mutation, but rather a, a certain variant or combination of these different genes. And so what we are trying to assess with polygenic screening is based on the DNA footprint, what is the risk of that specific embryo having these polygenetic or multiple gene diseases? And so it's telling you embryo A has a 60% chance of having asthma and embryo B has a 50% chance of having asthma. And it's basically putting the onus on the patient to say that this matters uh, and it's separate from embryo grading. So where I find this is gonna get really gray for all of us is what are you gonna use to make your decision for embryo selection? Is it gonna be the polygenic risk score 
that's very much not ready for prime time? Is it going to be the embryo grade? Is it going to be the PGTA, right? Because we're going to have all of these different variables that are going to go into selection. And it's probably going to make us all crazy. Um, and I think it depends on what's important to the patient. Um, I've certainly had, I've been in a room with couples who have said to me, you know, my brother committed suicide at 15 from parent schizophrenia. This is imperative that this doesn't get passed on. This is, this is it. This is my thing that needs to happen. You go, oh, okay. Right. So it's, it's going to be a very individual thing. Um, the data, the science is lacking a bit now. Um, but like everything else, I'm sure in 10 years, this is going to be like bygones and they're going to wonder why we ever talked about it. Right. I mean, I really wish we had whole genome sequencing of embryos. I think what people don't understand is we can only see chromosomes. We can't see these genes. And it's really difficult to, to figure out what's going on in an embryo. And right now we just have like tests that we've been, I mean, the, the, the carrier screening that we have today, it's basically the same technology that we've had for like the last almost 15 years. And uh, I think people think that what we do is a little bit more precise than it really is, don't you think? Absolutely, and you know, all the genome implantation, so much of that data is junk. It's, it doesn't mean anything to the embryo or us. And so it's sifting through to understand what of this is coding, what of this is important, right? How does it get spliced? And we just don't know that stuff yet. So when you have all this information, you just can't make heads and tails of it. Um, so it's really challenging. Right. So I know there are a lot of other big things down the road for fertility. Is there anything else you think that we should be on the lookout for? I think what's going to be fascinating is the research into the crosstalk between the embryo and the endometrium. And there have been many tests trying to get at this, right? The ERA test is one that people always know about um, that I'm sure we all have different feelings about. Um, but the goal of it is to understand what are we missing? They must talk to each other, right? And there's going to be a lot of information there. I find like gut microbiome and microbiology fascinating um, because I think our diets have changed so much. And I do believe that there is inflammation that may be playing a role in this. I've certainly, we all have anecdotes. I've certainly seen patients clean up their lifestyle, clean up their diets and three months later achieve success without my help, which I still count as a win. Okay, it's great. <laughs> um, so I think that's going to be an area that will get more traction and we hopefully will see improvements that are easy to do, right? Inexpensive, because everything we've talked about to date is incredibly expensive. Changing your diet is relatively inexpensive comparatively. Right. And for people who can try at home, that's a lot more fun than trying in our office. Absolutely. <laughs> you guys can both come into your homes. Our offices, every office is different, not so much. Um, so thank you, Katha. It has been such a pleasure talking to you today. Um, I really appreciate your time and your expertise and the compassion you obviously show to people and the precision care that you're offering. Can you just tell us again where people can find you? Yes, I am at Spring Fertility in New York City or Bryant Park. You can email us at hellospringfertility.com. We'd be thrilled to see you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Katha. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Amy. You as well. Bye. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadine, and you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 